declare any such coin legal tender because Congress certainly cannot mint private coins itself and cannot regulate the value of foreign coins that are not minted by some foreign government. The only condition or limitation of the state's exercise of the power to make gold and silver coin a tender is that the states must apply it comprehensively to both gold and silver coin. Under Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, a state may not adopt a monometallic gold standard or a monometallic silver standard, but must always employ the two monetary metals in tandem in a gold and silver standard. And of course, always in such a manner as to ensure that every particular transaction a tender that is required to be made in gold coin will deliver the same purchasing power as a tender that is required to be made in silver coin. But because of its placement in the Constitution, the state's power to make gold and silver coin a tender is effectively absolute. Now, you don't hear that mentioned too much about constitutional power as absolute, but this is one of the ones where uh, that really fits, that description really fits. And this is a conclusion that's compelled by the important differences among the three clauses of the ten. Sometime, pull out your Constitution and look at Article 1, Section 10 and those three clauses, you'll see this clearly. The first clause differs significantly from the following two, and then it begins, no state shall, and then it goes on to give a list of things that the state's prohibited from doing. Whereas the other two clauses commence, no state shall without the consent of Congress. So on its face, this divergent language imports an absolute prohibition with respect to the matters within the first clause, and a conditional prohibition with respect to the matters within the second and third clauses. Congress may permit or enable the states to do what the second and third clauses of Article 1, Section 10 prohibit, but Congress lacks authority to license or aid, let alone to command, any state to do anything within the first clause. And the states cannot contend that they may violate the first clause because Congress has somehow directed them or provided them with some means to do so. Also, if, if you take a look at the, uh, the primer that Alan, Aaron Bollinger can make available, uh, this point has been recognized quite early on and repeatedly in various decisions of the Supreme Court. Uh, and it's cited there with uh, quotations and uh, references to the actual uh, reports. The overall point then is pretty crystal clear on Article 1, Section 10. Pursuant to any of its powers, for any reason, Congress may not interfere with the fulfillment of any of those disabilities that Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 imposes upon the states. And of course, by a parity of constitutional reasoning, pursuant to any of its powers, for any reason, Congress may not interfere with the state's exercise of the power to make gold and silver coin a tender, which Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 explicitly reserves to the state. If all the prohibitions in that clause are beyond the power of Congress, then the state's reserved authority that exists in that clause is no less beyond Congress's power to negate. Therefore, the state's duty not to make anything but gold and silver coin a tender and their right, power, privilege, and duty to make gold and silver coin and tender are equally absolute. Now, of course, it's irrelevant which of its powers Congress might assert in aid of attempting to negate the state's authority to make gold and silver coin and tender. But let me give you what probably the, the typical example that would be thrown out by someone, and that, of course, is Congress's power to regulate commerce among the several states. It's rather obvious that that power could not be invoked to prevent a state from adopting an alternative currency of gold and silver coin for at least three reasons. First, by definition, a state and its governmental operations do not constitute any species of commerce at all because the state is an inherently political entity whereas commerce is an inherently economic activity in nature. Commerce and government are not the same things. If government were commerce, that the power to regulate commerce would enable Congress effectively to supersede and effectively become the state's government, which is uh, essentially an anti-constitutional absurdity. Secondly, an alternative currency adopted by an employee, employed within a single state for that state's governmental purposes is self-evidently not an activity that takes place among the several states. It's totally within that one state. Thirdly, even if these two can Inclusive definitional objections could be disregarded only for purposes of argument. There remain the considerations that the state's power to make gold and silver coin attendant and payment of debts is part of their so called police power. The Supreme Court has held that interstate commerce is indirectly affected 
uh, will not prevent the state from exercising its police power, at least until Congress and the exercise of its supreme authority regulates the particular subject. And in this particular instance, Congress can claim no supreme authority to prohibit the states from making gold and silver coin a tender because the Supreme Law of the Land, Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, has explicitly reserved that power to the states. And of course, Congress, by a statute, cannot override any provision of the Constitution. All right, so Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 uh, sets up a situation in which a state can adopt an alternative currency of gold and silver coin. And how would that be accomplished? Well, uh, the state would list various domestic and foreign silver and gold coins properly valued in, in terms of their amount of gold and silver contents as suitable for tender and payment of debts. And it would declare that these coins would be employed in certain, perhaps eventually all, financial transactions or other payments in the nature of debts that involve the state or subdivisions, employees, agents, contracts, and so forth. Uh, then it would recognize anyone anyway, else in the state who chose not to employ gold and silver coin as a tender could enter into a contract uh, payable in some other currency that the parties agreed to use. And it would facilitate the use of gold and silver coin by creating certain institutions and providing information to businessmen and so forth and so on. Uh, that's really listed and covered in, in the primer. The, the problem with the, the alternative currency based upon gold and silver coin is not constitutional. It's practical in the sense that it is somewhat cumbersome in this day and age to use gold and silver as an immediate medium of exchange through coinage. So I'd like to skip over to an alternative currency based upon gold and silver in a form other than coin. It is certainly possible to imagine such a system, in fact, more than imagine, because I think you already heard from uh, Mr. Turk on what uh, company gold money is doing in the private sector. Uh, but the important point here is that nothing in the Constitution prohibits the state from adopting any alternative currency. As long as in so doing, the state does not coin money, emit bills of credit, or make anything but gold and silver coin and tender and payment of debts. Perspective. Probably the best alternative currency available today is so-called electronic gold currency, electronic silver currency. Here, electronic refers to the method for recording and transferring legal title to specific amounts of gold and silver bullion that is actually held by an electronic currency provider in special ailment accounts for the depositors' use as currency. Electronic gold and silver currency offer numerous advantages over gold and silver coins deposited in the typical uh, banks. Foremost among these are security. Of course, the gold and silver on deposit are owned by the depositors themselves not owned by the electronic currency providers that hold the deposits. And of course, with a typical bank, it's exactly the opposite. A deposit becomes the property of the bank, with the depositor merely a general creditor of the bank for the value of the deposit. So it's superior on that level. Uh, secondly, ubiquity. Anyone maintaining an account with an electronic currency provider can easily acquire gold and silver through the provider and then deal with anyone else holding such an account anywhere in the world. That's one of the great advantages of this system. It's uh, universal in that sense. Convenience is another advantage. Transactions in gold and silver coin can be affected with debit cards or like instruments, excuse me, electronic gold and silver, can be affected with debit cards or like instruments. So if the payment of gold and silver is had immediately, but the actual gold and silver never has to leave the electronic currency provider's vaults. Of course, transactions can also be affected on the basis of paper receipts and the nature of check or on the basis of actual physical, physical delivery of gold and silver, parties may desire that. Another advantage is flexibility. And this is very important. Transactions of very small and exact values can be made, which is really impossible with coins. Because with coinage, you have coins only of certain denominations, and then any transaction that falls within those denominations requires some method for making change, small change. And in the past, that has either been some form of token coinage, such as uh, copper or nickel, or the use of paper currency of one kind or another, bank checks. Uh, accuracy, of course, is another advantage of the electronic system because the details of every transaction, since they have to go through the electronic currency provider, can be automatically recorded for purposes of accounting, and you talk about the date, the time, the parties, the location, the nature of the transaction, and also the value of the transaction, not only in gold and silver, but for 
perhaps in Federal Reserve notes or any other common media of exchange. That can all be done on a computerized uh, fashion. Every transaction uh, can be tagged with all that information. Now, to put such a system into practice, the state will establish within her government an official electronic gold and silver currency provider. And that might be the state treasurer itself, state treasury itself, or by lease technology or hire uh, outside firm to provide that function. Particular depositors, gold and silver, would be held in separate bailment accounts, so the system could not be accused of operating on the basis of unconstitutional electronic bills of credit or economically unsound fractional reserves. Yet the gold and silver would be impressed with the attributes of the state's sovereign power because the state had designated that gold and silver as her alternative currency. Thus, the gold and silver in the state's depository would be serving not only the particular purposes of the various depositors, but also the public purpose of guaranteeing the state's economic homeland security. Consequently, not only the gold and silver deposited by the state herself and all the governmental bodies and agencies within her jurisdiction, but also the gold and silver deposited by the vast majority of her population would be protected by a governmental immunity from any form of interference on the part of agents of the government in Washington or the Federal Reserve. Now, for constitutional purposes, the distinction between electronic gold currency, electronic silver currency, consisting of gold or silver bullion, on the one hand, and actual gold or silver coin, on the other hand, is small in practice and really inconsequential in principle. And this problem was addressed by the Supreme Court in 1869. Thought that this was a new difficulty. The Supreme Court looked at this at that time in the case of Bronson versus Rhodes. An issue in that case was whether a private contractual obligation of dollars payable in gold and silver coin or money in the United States Notwithstanding that stipulation payable in the United States Treasury notes, which Congress had declared to be legal tender, but were not redeemable in either gold or silver. Well, in order to determine the precise import of the law in the key contractual phrase, the court went through a long analysis of all the coinage act of Congress of 1792 onwards, observing that and I quote, the design of all of this minuteness and strictness and the regulation of coinage recognizes the fact, accepted by all men throughout the world, that value is inherent in the precious metals, that gold and silver of themselves values as being such are the only proper measure of value, and that these values are determined by weight and purity. And then the court went on to say that every dollar is a piece of gold or silver certified to be of a certain weight and purity by the form and impress given to it at the mint and therefore declared to be legal tender payments. And from all this, the court concluded that a contract to pay a certain number of dollars in gold or silver coins is therefore a legal import, nothing else than an agreement to deliver a certain weight of standard gold to be ascertained by account of coins, each of which is certified to contain a definite proportion of that weight. It is not distinguishable in principle from a contract to deliver an equal weight of bullion and equal fineness. It is distinguishable only in circumstance by the fact that the sufficiency of the amount to be tendered in payment must be ascertained in the case of bullion by assay and the scale, while in the case of coin, it may be ascertained by count. So, following that reasoning, it's very clear that making gold and silver coin a tender is really not distinguishable in constitutional principle from making an equal weight of bullion, gold and silver bullion, of equal fineness a tender. Now, of course, one can always say, well, the Supreme Court may be wrong. <clears throat> we hear that sometimes, questioning the wisdom of the Supreme Court decision. But even if the Supreme Court were wrong to conclude in the Bronson case that gold and silver coin on the one hand, gold and silver bullion on the other hand, are constitutionally equivalent, the states could nonetheless adopt gold and silver bullion as an alternative currency. This would not be under the state's authority to make gold and silver coin a tender of payment and debt. But in order to function economically, an alternative currency consisting of gold and silver bullion need not be made a tender at all by statute. Instead, the parties, to, the parties to contracts between the public and private sectors could voluntarily adopt such a currency as the exclusive medium of exchange for the purposes of these contracts. All the state would have to do would be to say, we the state intend to enter into these contracts, but it was willing to do it, and it could be uh, used, gold and silver bullion could be used even though they were not made a tender by the state. Now, of course, there's another, even uh, perhaps broader reason supporting the state's authority to make alternative currency. And that was decided in the case of Lane County versus 
in Oregon, just after the Civil War in 1869. In that case, the, the state courts had ruled that as a matter of the state law of Oregon, certain taxes, county and state taxes, were required to be collected in silver and gold coins. An issue when the case of the Supreme Court was whether notwithstanding the state law, those taxes could be paid in United States Treasury notes, which were at that time not redeemable in either gold or silver coin. The Supreme Court held that the state could not be compelled to accept payment of taxes in those notes. Now I'll read you this little excerpt from the, from the court's opinion. The people of the United States constitute one nation under one government, this government within the scope of which is invested is supreme. On the other hand, the people of each state compose a state having its own government and endowed with all the functions essential to separate and independent existence. The states disunited might continue to exist without the states in union. There could be no political body such as the United States. Goes on to talk about the power of taxation of the states and says, in conclusion, the extent to which it shall be exercised, that is the power of taxation by the state, the subjects upon which it shall be exercised, and the mode in which it shall be exercised are all equally within the discretion of the legislatures to which the states commit the exercise of the power. There is nothing in the Constitution which contemplates or authorizes any direct abridgment of this power by national legislation. If, therefore, the condition of any state in the judgment of its legislature requires the collection of taxes in kind, that is to say, by the delivery to the proper offices of a certain proportion of products or in gold and silver bullion or in gold and silver coin, it is not easy to see upon what principle the national government can interfere with the exercise to that end of this power, original in the states, and never as yet surrendered. Now, the rationale for that conclusion was, as the court said, to the existence of the states themselves necessary to the existence of the United States, the power of taxation is indispensable. It is an essential function of government. So the principle of the Wayne County case was that when the state is exercising an essential function of government, it may choose whatever medium of exchange may be necessary to perform that function, notwithstanding that Congress has set up some other medium of exchange and even made it purportedly a legal tender. And there have been other decisions besides Wayne County going in the same direction, which laid out a fairly wide avenue for the state's emancipation, as it were, as it were, from congressional medium of exchange on the gold and silver coin. Because that principle applies to all of the so-called sovereign or governmental functions of a state, such as taxation, public spending, public borrowing, the power of eminent domain, the jurisdiction of the courts, and one can go on and list others. And I put into that primer a list of those with citations to various court cases which are applicable. So nowhere does the Constitution authorize the government of Washington to abridge any of these powers that are so fundamental to the existence, authority, operations, and responsibility of the states as states. And therefore, the Constitution nowhere authorizes Congress to prevent the states from choosing to use some alternative currency in order to perform these governmental functions. Now, finally, we come to essentially a constitutional come statutory point. The ability of the states to employ gold clause contracts as a means to adopt an alternative currency. What you have to realize here is that under the present statutory scheme created by Congress, the states can adopt an alternative currency by the simple expedient of including gold clauses or silver clauses, if you will, in their contract or obligations. So they already have that power statutorily. They don't even potentially wouldn't have to get into a constitutional question unless that Congress attempted to repeal that statute. Now, the benefit of these clauses, of course, would accrue not only to the states themselves, but also to every other party contracting with them on that basis. Because, of course, it takes two parties to make a contract, the state on one side and someone on the other, and they both are going to avail themselves of the benefit of that kind of a contract. Now, interestingly enough, Congress, as I said, recognized the statutory ground for gold clauses today, but there really is a constitutional basis for them as well. First, the state 
an exercise for absolute constitutional right and duty to pay gold and silver coins as under payment of debts under Article 1, Section 10, through the medium of gold clauses and silver clauses. That certainly is one way that you can determine what the tender and payment of a particular debt will be, running a contract with respect to it. Therefore, the ability to enter into and enforce such contracts is part and parcel of the state's authority to make gold and silver coin a tender, with which, as I pointed out before, Congress has no authority to interfere. Secondly, when a state exercises their sovereign prerogative to employ gold and silver as alternative currency in the performance of the various governmental functions that we just talked about, under the aegis of decisions such as uh, Lane County versus Oregon, then those gold, gold clauses or silver clauses become the instrumentalities through which those governmental functions are performed. And therefore, they can't be subject to interference by Congress on that ground. Final point, because I hear this every now and then. Well, yes, maybe they could do this, but the people in Washington would respond in the way the Franklin Roosevelt regime did in 1933-34, and they might attempt to seize gold and silver from the states, as well as from individuals. Well, I think that view is what I would call historically and constitutionally myopic, because although Roosevelt administration did seize gold from the American people in 33 and 34, it never attempted to seize silver. So there really is no precedent for such action as for that metal. And although the seizure of gold itself was never reversed in the sense of returning the gold that was seized to its original owners, of course, the right of average Americans to own gold was finally restored in 1973 and, and 1974. And the, interestingly enough, the legality of the gold seizure as to any dispossessed holder was never adjudicated in the Supreme Court. It's rather uh, shocking to realize that because that was uh, one of the uh, most contentious actions uh, of the New Deal. And yet it never was decided in the Supreme Court. People who want to read the background of that, I have a long section in my book, Pieces of Eight, where it goes into great detail about why that happened, how it happened, and what the consequence of it is. But certainly the ultimate consequence at this stage is that there is no uh, controlling legal authority coming out of the Supreme Court uh, justifying any kind of uh, gold seizure, or, or silver seizure for that matter. And on the other side, of course, the constitutional argument is that the government of Washington cannot enforce a gold or silver seizure against the states because for the state to be able to exercise her absolute, uh, focusing on that word, her absolute constitutional right and duty to make gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debts, that coin, or its constitutional equivalent in gold silver bullion, must always be available within the state for that purpose, either in the hands of the state's officials or in the hands of such private persons as may be required by the state's laws to employ gold and silver as a tender. By seizing gold and silver, the government of Washington would disable the state and her citizens in practice for making gold and silver coin a tender, and would thereby effectively nullify the state's constitutional right to do so, which of course is beyond the authority of Congress. Second, for a state to exercise her sovereign prerogative to employ gold and silver in whatever form as an alternative currency in the performance of her governmental functions under the aegis of decisions such as Lane County versus Oregon, which I cited earlier, the state, and again those dealing with her, must have permanent access to the gold and silver necessary and sufficient for those purposes. For instance, if a state declares that her taxes must be paid in gold and silver, then her tax-paying citizens must be able to acquire, as a matter of both one fact, the gold and silver necessary to perform their duties in that regard. By seizing all gold and silver, the general government, Government of Washington, D.C., would be preventing the state and her citizens performing those governmental functions, thereby effectively denying the state's governmental status and sovereignty in violation of the entire scheme of the federal government correctly interpreted that the Constitution has established. Therefore, such a purported seizure would be unconstitutional and void. So the arguments in, in favor of doing this at the constitutional level are quite strong, and certainly there has never been any decision coming out of the uh, Supreme Court uh, indicating anything other than the states having a reserved authority to take this kind of action. 
I look at this problem ultimately not as a legal one. I mean, uh, at some stage, I suppose there would be some challenge raised to it, uh, and you'd have to go through the, the exercise of making these kinds of arguments. But it's ultimately one of political education, convincing people of the necessity to take this kind of action as quickly as possible. And that's why I'm very much in favor of the bill you know, just I think just put in in South Carolina, put in in Virginia recently, uh, to establish an investigatory committee or commission to study this question. Because step number one is to lay on the table in great detail the problem the country is facing, the alternatives that are available to deal with that problem, and to hear from the other side. Uh, the one thing I keep saying is I cannot understand anyone who would question the prudence and the propriety of investigating this problem. It strikes me that that would be the most irresponsible approach that anyone could take the ostrich with the head in the sand saying, let's not even think about it. You may not like the answer that comes out after you've done the inquiry, but the inquiry is obviously necessary. And on the other side, I find it very difficult to imagine how an argument could be made about an alternative currency. I think it would be equivalent to uh, an argument being made against having automobile insurance. You obviously, when you go out on the road, you don't expect to wait, just as it was too late they had reached about the middle of the North Atlantic. Right? There was no going back at that point. So I leave that with you because uh, you legislators certainly are the ones who uh, have the hot potato. As uh, Harry Truman said, the buck stops here and you're here. And if there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Well said. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Dr. Vieira? A number of excellent points. Anyone from, how about from the legislature? Uh, David, do you have any, anything to say? Yeah, 